Snap Judgment Studios. Daily Show correspondent Dulce Sloan and writer Josh Johnson are best friends who rarely agree on anything. On the new podcast called Hold Up with Dulce Sloan and Josh Johnson, they turn their hilarious, unpredictable, and legendary office banter into a war of words about topics big and small, mostly small, from texting versus calling to club bangers versus conscious rap and everything in between. Listen to Hold Up with Dulce Sloan and Josh Johnson from The Daily Show every Thursday on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Attention shoppers, we now have Taste in the Bread Aisle, Dave's Killer Bread. That's right, an organic bread that's no longer a sedative for your taste buds. Dave's Killer Bread is on a mission to make the most of the loaf, to rid the world of GMOs, high fructose corn syrup, and artificial ingredients, and plant the seeds of good in all that they bake. Killer taste, killer texture, always organic. Dave's Killer Bread. Bread Amplified. Okay, so you know that Hawaii is a magical place. People go to Hawaii for fun, for rest, relaxation. Others have lived there for generations. In Hawaii, people freely toss around the word paradise without even a touch of irony. But on January 13th, 2018, at exactly 8.07 a.m., one text message unified everyone on the island in panic. From Snap Judgment's Underground Lair in WNYC Studios, this is a very special presentation for us, Snappers. We're calling it This Is Not A Drill. It's a little bit different than what we normally do, but I know you're going to dig it. We begin in Pearl Harbor. In fact, at the Pearl Harbor Memorial, where Brian Rowe was in line waiting to see some history, not realizing he'd be living some history himself. Snap judgment. Park Ranger tells us, you know, first we're going to go see a film. And it's a short film. Um, and they, they took us into this little, like, sunken movie theater. Honolulu. First pictures of the attack on the Hawaiian island, delivered while Japanese envoys talked of peace in Washington. Japanese bombers overhead. And it's, you know, black and white newsreels. And I feel my phone buzz in my pocket. And, um, you know, I. I see a couple other people in the theater pull their phones out and check it and start looking around. So I pull my phone out thinking, you know, what is this? I I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe it's some cool technology they have, you know, trying to immerse you in, in the feeling of, you know, of what happened at Pearl Harbor. The U S Pacific command has detected a missile threat to Hawaii. A missile may impact on land or sea within minutes. This is not a drill. Hello, police. How can I help you? Um, yes, I'd like to know if there's any news report coming out about this emergency alert. Hello, police. How can I help you? I, I need to know if the ballistic missile threat is real. I was going down to the beach at around 7 in the morning to paddle my... Uh, my OC1, my one-man canoe, walked down to the water, um, took a picture, actually, a video of the water because um, it was one of the most beautiful days I'd ever seen out on the water. The water was like pink and light blue. And then one of my teammates said, I just got this weird notification on my phone about a missile. I was just in bed, and then I heard my mom go like, what, 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 in the other room. Dad comes in. I, I don't know how you were exactly i don't think you believed it i don't, I don't think it really i'm glad you think that because that was the impression i was trying to give you mm-hmm. and there is there is uh my favorite shirt hanging there so i put that on it's like a rainbow shirt i love it uh do you have it 
Okay. Do you like Miller? Okay, yeah, yeah. Whose shirt is that? It's it's my dad's. <laughs> I steal a lot of his clothes. <laughs> but okay. yeah, so it was, it was, it was um, just kind of like, okay, I might as well be comfortable if I'm about to die. That was going to be my last day of work. I got paid to take people out, people who were on vacation, who were looking to have a good time. And that's the boat we were. And I remember as we were getting out on the boat and just kind of going about our chores, I just stopped and I was taking it all in, knowing it was going to be my last time out there. We untied our boat and we started heading to pick up our guests. As we're motoring, the crew doesn't have much to do. I remember simultaneously, we all got this message. I just dropped my daughter off at the airport, and I was heading back to get uh, pick up breakfast for the meeting for everybody. Um, I went to this uh, drive-in called Zippy's um, on Nimitz Highway. Uh, and I walked in, and all the girls behind the counter were kind of... Um, mumbling to each other and they were looking kind of concerned. I didn't know what it was. And, and at first I thought somebody was saying bomb threat, bomb threat. We had gotten up, we'd made our breakfast. We were going to go look for shells on the beach and just look forward to a really nice day. And as we were on our way to the beach, my cell phone went off with this warning. The U.S. Pacific Command has detected a missile threat to Hawaii. A missile may impact on land or sea within minutes. This is not a drill. We just looked at each other, my boyfriend and I, and we decided, well, there's no place to hide. And we went ahead and went on to the beach. And within a few minutes, he just started throwing up and just throwing up. And he thought getting in the water might help, so he got in the water splash the ocean on you, you know, to cool you off. He just kept getting sicker and sicker. And he, he says, we, we need to go somewhere. I need to, to get help. And so I tried 911, and there was no way to get through 911. It was busy, busy, busy. 911, police fire ambulance. Neither one. I want to know about this alert that came over, and I called okay. six times, 911, and no one answered at all. No yeah. one 911 answered. If you are indoors, stay indoors. A missile may impact on land or sea within minutes. This is not a drill. We are nearing the 14 minute mark, I think. We're running the water in the tub. We have medical supplies, we have battery. So, you know, we're all sitting in this really tiny, narrow bathroom, holding each other's hands and stuff like that. Um, and just, you know, uh, crying, really. That was the big moment. And it's not the awareness of death that comes from a loved one passing away. It's the awareness of death that comes from facing your own death as a very real possibility. It was kind of empty feeling mm, for me. Really strange. It was. It was. It was like, uh, like suddenly there was nothing there anymore. I guess. You know, I I didn't really understand the gravity of the situation until Dad started freaking out. I think. And I do work for the Department of Defense in uh, countermeasure development, antidotes for biological weapons. Uh, yes, I would say I'm probably more aware than than typical Hawaii resident of what the nuclear threats were. You know, there are people who are killed instantly, vaporized instantly. And then there are people who are horribly burned by the heat of the explosion. And then there are people who will die horribly of radiation exposure in the next days and weeks. And um, the horror of dealing with that, even if we survived, was coming up if you are outdoors seek immediate shelter in a building we will announce when the threat has ended this is not a drill the moment was just terrifying all of it was under the the stopwatch of time and really the kind of thing that set me off was all these 
SUVs blazing down the highway behind me with their lights on, and they're going somewhere, and the, the first decision was actually believing that this alert was real. And Lord knows it, it said, this is not a drill. Decision number two was, who do I go to, and can I save anybody? Um, I definitely felt that I had to go somewhere. And then I had the fact that my wife, my two younger children and my oldest child were in three different directions to go to. So I had to figure out who I would go to. I need to save my children. I hopped in my canoe. I started to paddle away from the crowd. Na o ma kua mai kalahi ki a kalakau. Mai ko oku i a kahala wai. Na o ma kua i a kahi na kua i a I began a chant that I was taught as a child called na o ma kua. Nu nulu i kalani. Ka holo i kalani. E ano na pula pula o ko o Hawaii. That asks all these these ancestors and gods and spirits to come and join me on this journey and, and ask them to grant me knowledge and understanding and strength and to protect me. Uh, and this is something I do every time I get into the water on my canoe, but it definitely took on a a stronger meaning that morning. I remember looking at my captain and he kind of looked up at all of us and he's like, is this a joke? Like, is this for real? <laughs> he's just like, this. And he turned the boat right around. We go back to our mooring. We tie up maybe 100 feet offshore. We're all trying to gather information. We still have the, the Coast Guard hailing frequency on. But radio silence, nothing was coming from, from that end. And then I texted my mom. I just said, I love you. I didn't tell her why. The lack of information was deafening. That's kind of feeding the panic, right? I, I don't know. The, the thing that really pulled on... on me was I had to run away from one of my daughters. I had to run in the opposite direction. I really felt like if I went towards the airport where I thought the, the missile would be aimed at our biggest military base being Pearl Harbor, right? If I went to try to get my oldest daughter, I'd be dead, she'd be dead. There'd be no hope for anybody. And then I figured all oh, my two younger daughters were off in the other direction. Like I was going to swoop in and you know, cover my children and it was going to be okay. Uh, I think my biggest concern was that my oldest daughter was kind of forfeit at this point. Like, there was nothing I could do to get to the airport. But I basically texted my oldest daughter, you know, I'm heading home to your sisters, I love you. You know, and I, I just took off in the other direction. Take immediate action measures. Repeat, this is not a drill. We jumped out of bed at the same time. Like, I remember our feet hit the floor at the same time. And the screen of my phone is taken over by this alert that says something like, incoming ballistic missile, seek shelter immediately, this, this is, is not, not a drill. drill. Take immediate action measures. Repeat. The U.S. Pacific And Katie immediately went into full-on Batman mode. Zero skepticism. She said, oh no, we have 15 minutes at most. She then grabbed exactly what we needed, said, come on, we need to get to the house and wake up the parents. And we just took off running. Remain indoors well away from windows. If you are driving... Pull safely to the side of the road and seek shelter in a building or lay on the floor. This is not a drill. So I open it and I look at it and say, oh no, no way. You know, this, this is not a drill. It, it is real, you know, and take cover. And I said, hmm. Where am I going to go? There's no place I can go to. And some of them I heard, they went to the tunnel. 
and I think they all drive up there and stay inside the tunnel. That was a big mistake to me because they don't know how powerful this bomb is. So powerful. I would prefer to die. Instant, you know, instant. Take me up there because I know more people, more friends up there than here. And I said, okay, let's remember when it happened to me in Hiroshima, atomic bomb. I was only 12 years old, that happened. And it's 8.15 in the morning, I, taught, I was going to school, and uh, I catch train. Well, after I got on the train, about hmm, maybe about five minutes, such a bright light hit us. Big mushroom cloud. And we don't know what's going on. What? What that? So everybody gets panicked. So the doors are open. So we all jump off. Then uh, after we jump off, my girlfriend says, "Oh, it's sore. Look at it. my arm is sore." And I look at it; it's all burned. Her skin just peeling off. We saw the lot of people coming out from city. And look at like they all burned. Uh, you cannot tell it's men or women. Cans all peeling off her face, arms. Had half the clothes is all burned, and they all coming this way. I thought, oh gee, I'm in hell or what? It it was terrible because we don't know what's going on. And no more house. My mother never come back. From next day, we all have to go out to the city, try to find mom. We we'll walk all day looking for her. Day after day, you know, we just walking, trying to find her. But we never did find her. When Stamp Judgment returns, paradise shows her other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Stamp Judgment, but this is not a drill special. On January 13, 2018, at exactly 8.07 in the morning, one text message pushed the state of Hawaii into a state of emergency. U.S. Pacific Command has detected a missile threat to Hawaii. A missile may impact on land or sea within minutes. This is not a drill. We saw these warnings come over on television. And when I looked at them, I thought, this is insane. This is ridiculous. There is no place to take cover. I was just truly pissed off at the United States. Because I'm thinking, why the hell should we ever be a target for somebody else? It made me really angry because the only reason that that is true is because of Pearl Harbor. From Pearl Harbor, a sinister plume of heavy smoke rises skyward. And I don't, I don't know if people are just, they're, they're just used to being reserved and like following the rules or if, if people were just, you know, caught up in the film or whatever it was. Hawaii's bright Sunday becomes a black Sunday. No one, no one got up. No one, no one did anything. Um, you know, we just kept the sitting there watching the film. And when the lights came on, um, a park ranger came in. And we thought, you know, this is, this doesn't seem out of the ordinary. I mean, the alert is weird, but, and a park ranger comes in and big booming voice. And he says, you know, ladies and gentlemen, there is, there's, been this alert. Um, we're going to need everybody just to stay put in here. Uh, we're going to bring other people that are outside in here and just please stay inside. This little auditorium that was meant to hold maybe, you know, 70, 80 people probably has 400 in it now. 
and we're kind of packed in there really well. Braver people, I guess, are, are starting to yell out, you know, demanding information like what's going on. Everybody's just completely lost and in a disarray. And there's a detachment of Marines that are there, and they are just, they're just beside themselves. You know, and these are men and women in uniform, so they're not helping <laughs> the regular people that are in there. You know, people are generally, I mean, genuinely starting to freak out at this point. This is the reality we live in as Hawaiians living in Hawaii, that we are constantly under threat. But I've always felt really safe in the ocean. And I remember being out there and, and just looking back on the mountains and you can just see the entire Ko'olau mountain range. And I remember looking at those mountains and thinking like, okay, a missile could be coming at this moment. Um, and I felt at peace. Uh, I don't believe I'm supposed to outlive these islands. As a Hawaiian, we understand this, I think, in our bodies. If these mountains were to be destroyed by a nuclear attack, then I would want to be destroyed with it. I was kind of just pushing my little uh, Honda Fit as fast as I could get it to go between stoplights and still strangely stopping for stoplights. Uh, some little voice in my head was saying, you're never going to make it home kind of this terror driving, I'm not going to make it home, where are my kids, I'm not going to make it to my kids. And I just hammer the pedal and just take off again uh, till I get to the next light. I definitely felt powerless. It was definitely a, a, a futile drive. It was a futile moment of time that I was just trying to do anything I could possibly do. Things were moving in slow motion while I was driving. Um, the cars going behind me with their sirens and lights on. It felt like I just saw it in the review mirror in slow motion. Everything just seemed to be very... like nobody else was moving. It, it felt like the world was frozen around me. So time was, was, was slippery that morning. I had to make a choice that people don't have to make in life. Like, not too many people have to mentally make a choice between their children. Remain indoors well away from windows. We will announce when the threat has ended. This is not a drill. So she corralled us all in, um, in the most protected room in the house. Um, it was a very small room. We had to bring in an extra chair and we sat with all of our knees kind of pushed together. We were all there. We had water. We had food. We had coffee. We had coffee. And then we sat and, you know, we kind of stared at each other for a few minutes and kind of went around. And I don't remember who said it first. It might have been me, but I was just like, you know, I'm really glad. Like, this sucks. This is awful. But I'm really glad we're all here for it together. And so we kind of went around the room and told each other we loved each other, and it was very sweet. And then we got online to see what was happening. But, but you're skipping over Oh, the bit where you turn to me and you say, you know, if this does hit, I'm just really sad we had never gotten married. I don't know why that is what my brain chose as so important. I'm kind of pissed that I don't get to die as your wife. Like, you know, at the very least, we've been engaged for five years. Like, you know, that would have been nice. Like, that was the only regret I had. If, if this is a false alert, we should definitely get on that. <laughs> that is exactly what you said. I remember that now. I remember you saying, yeah, we should get on that. <laughs> It is a very windy road from Sandy Beach to the Hawaii Kai Clinic. And as soon as he got in there, he collapsed. They worked on him to get his heart going. They told me that they didn't know if they could revive him. They were yelling and screaming. The diagnosis was um, heart attack on, brought on by anxiety. They call it the Widowmaker. And he was basically dead, they told me, for 11 minutes. False alarm. 
there is no missile threat or danger to the state of Hawaii. 911, please, fire ambulance. Is the missile coming? Okay, ma'am, ignore the message you got on your phone. It was sent in error. Everything is fine. It's a false alarm. Oh, oh thank God. Okay, bye. Okay, bye. Please, may I help you? Did you guys uh, get an alert of it? It, it, was a, it was a drill. The, the wrong message went out. It was supposed to say this is a drill. You said at the bottom this is not a drill. Yeah, it was, the message was supposed to say this is a drill. But the wrong header went out. That's a really bad mistake to make. Yeah, I know, sir. Okay, bye. All right, thank you. Repeat, there is no missile threat or danger to the state of Hawaii. False alarm. So yeah, I saw the official all clear on my phone. It was like, all right, good. I am glad that's over. Now I'm going to be, you know, very angry and very sad at the same time and not really understand why. We keep planning on, you know, s setting the date, planning mm -hmm. the party, mm -hmm. putting together the guest list. And one of the things we do is we either refer to each other as, um, <clears throat> excuse me, as spouses, or we call each other partner. Because when you say fiance, the first question everyone says is, oh, when's the wedding date? And it's like, I don't know. We waited a few days and we were like, should we actually set a date? Yeah, you know, I think we should. Okay, yeah. uh, how long? I don't know. I think these things are supposed to be like eight months to 18 months. I don't know if I want to wait a year and a half. <laughs> And then it was like, okay, so where should it be? This is a conversation we have had before. Like every three months for yeah. the last, going to be six years in October. Right. Oh my God, six years. Right, yeah. Sorry. Um, so so we it went, it went from the clarity of, yes, we must do this. How has it taken so long to, oh, right, this, this is why it's taken so long. I just pulled over. Um, and that's when all the emotions of the the you know, t the decisions kind of came to me. Um, the fact that I had written off my oldest daughter, the fact that I believed I couldn't save my two younger children, the fact that I had to kind of ignore my wife, and I kind of just broke down. I actually just cried. I, I pulled over on the side of the road, and I just kind of welled up and cried. The kind of cry like you don't want anybody to see. After I, I'd, I'd sat and I kind of cried my eyes out, here's the text I, I actually sent to my wife. I said, I hope you were oblivious to this morning's terror. I do love you. We canceled all, all our plans for the day. Yeah, we, we just stayed together. That yeah. Day. We did go get malatadas. <laughs> um, they're a, a Portuguese donut covered with sugar. It's really good. You know, it's, it's a, a, a real treat here. And so we go out and get that, and we're just like, you know, it's, it's so weird being out in the world after it happened. I remember seeing people just, like, uh, laughing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was just trying to take in as much as I could all of a sudden. You know, we'd done that drive a million times. I was just, like, looking at everything. You know, the, there are trees in the center. You know, I was just trying to remember those trees. I, I think the thing about the donut run that, that I recall is I see the light again. The way the light in Hawaii, the angle of the light during the day and the way it hits the leaves and the way it shines over the mountains and the way it reflects off the water is different from anywhere else I've ever been. And I saw it again that afternoon. It's a beautiful day. You could just see like all the tension that we were holding in just kind of lets itself go. And we're all just kind of high-fiving and screaming like, yeah, we're not going to die today. Like, it's pretty cool. And then, then we all realize like, hey, we don't have to go to work either. Like, we got the whole day off now. Like, everything in life seems so sweet. And like, everything had this gold hue to it. We see maybe 200 yards away, a mom humpback and her calf, you know, just slowly cruise out to where they are. And we jump in the water with our masks and our fins. 
and we just follow these whales out into the channel. And uh, so, well, we we follow the whales, which is much harder to do as a human. It was humbling. It was humbling to be in the water next to something so magnificent. We got as close as 10 feet away from them, you know, diving down and being on the same level as the whale. So not not looking down at them from the surface, but actually being eye to eye with them underwater. If you haven't ever heard a whale before, it's it's kind of a high-pitched squeak is the best word that comes to mind right now. It's not unpleasant at all. It's not harsh on the ears. But you're underwater, so the sound is just carrying and reverberating. So you're immersed in it. It's the, the sound is all around you and going through you as well. And we're just beside ourselves. We we can't even process what's going on from going to think that the world is ending to sharing the coolest experience that any of us had ever had. Both of those experiences stripped everything away and reveal the rawness of life. I think I could honestly do with remembering that day a little more often. It puts life into a, a clearer perspective. Life ain't that bad, you know? It could get a lot worse real quick. I do get emotional about this. This this place, Hawaii, these islands, um, there really is actually a spirit here. That anyone who has ever come here and decided, I don't want to live anywhere else, they, they know what this place is about. What might happen to all of these beautiful places, these hills, these pools, the ocean, all of this turned into some kind of radioactive heap really pissed me off. I've never seen a bartender busier at, you know, 10 a.m. on a Sunday. I mean, everybody, everybody that was there was, they, everybody ordered, you know, four of everything, you know, the, the extra large, you know, margarita or Mai Tai, and, you know, put an extra shot of rum. And, I mean, everybody was just a buzz. Everybody was just happy as can be. I mean, I think the waiters probably made the most in tips they've ever made that day. I mean, every everybody was really just giddy as can be. Our waitress had no idea, had no idea any of it happened. She had rolled out of bed maybe an hour before and come, come into work. And she's like, yeah, I mean, it's such a crazy day. And we're like, you, you don't know what happened? She, oh no, you know, I lost my phone a couple days ago. So I just, I just came into work. I haven't really caught up on anything. What's going on? It is hurt. I mean, you cry, you cannot cry enough. Really, I don't want nobody to experience what I experience. So I said, okay, I don't want to go through all that again. So I'm going back to bed. I would prefer to die. So I went to sleep. Thank you so much to all those who spoke to us about their experience. Special thanks to Brian Rowe, Jonathan in Jamaica Osorio, Katie and Basil, Sean T.C. O'Malley and Ruby J.A. O'Malley, Jessica Lanyato, Tanoa Tom and Sarah Kailani, Donna Blanchard, Bitsuko Heidke, everyone at the Offshore Podcast and the Queen Kapiolani Hotel in Waikiki. Another snap special presentation brought to you by Team Snap. It was edited by Anna Sussman with additional production assistance by Nancy Lopez. That original score and sound design was by Renzo Gorio and Leon Morimoto. The producers included Anna Sussman, Eliza Smith, Erica Lance, John Facile. The senior producer was Jasmine Aguilera. Aw, Snap is... 
It's about that time it is, but all is not lost. Why? Because if you missed even a moment, or if you didn't, more Snap Judgment storytelling awaits. Just subscribe to the amazing Snap Judgment Storytelling Podcast wherever you get your podcast. Snap is brought to you by the team that never yells fire in a crowded building. Show some love to the Uber producer, Mr. Mark Ristich, Mr. Safety himself, Pat Masini Miller, Anna, the fire captain Sussman, Nancy the Hall Monitor Lopez, Smoke Detector Renzo Gorio, Eliza, Pat Wrangler Smith, Crossing Guard, Adiza Egan, Armed Guard, Liz Mack, Leon, Lifeguard Morimoto, Tail, Technical Supervisor Dakot, Jasmine, Lockdown Aguilera. And even though this is not the news, no way is this the news. In fact, you could run top speed toward the Red Sea, leading your people away from Pharaoh's angry chariots, and even as the water mysteriously parts, allowing your people to escape, someone still dares complain. Oh, I'm not so sure about this whole parting waters thing. And even then, even still, you would not be as far away from the news as this is. But this is W. N. Why?